The elixir of long life, Master Zanoni received his Chaldean initiation in the most remote ages and remained young for thousands of years. Megner, Zanoni's companion, also lived for ages. These masters were invincible and death could not touch them. They were citizens of an ancient nation that has since disappeared. Chaldea. What was their secret? What was their power? As we reach the present chapter of this work, many surgeons, unversed in the hidden medicine, will look down upon and mock the elixir of long life, considering these teachings insensible. Unbalanced Rosicrucians and the spiritually sick in spiritualism have never understood or are unwilling to admit that the elixir of long life, the philosopher's stone, and the key to perpetual motion, are found within the testicles of the male and the uterus of the female. We have already stated, and we will not tire of repeating it, that initiation is life itself, intensely lived, and that the redemption of humanity resides exclusively in the sexual act. When our work, The Perfect Marriage, was circulated, as we had foreseen, numerous critics labeled us as pornographic for speaking in a straightforward language that anyone could understand, and for providing the key to sexual magic. However, we know that to the pure, all things are pure, and to the impure, all things are impure. These so-called paragons of wisdom, sick mystics through their morbid speculations that they consider super-transcendent, labeled us as materialists. These individuals are completely ignorant that nothing can exist, not even God, without the aid of matter. Some old and debilitated individuals, worn out by passionate coitus, and unsatisfied sexual devotees, horrified, cast aside the book, labeling it scandalous and pornographic. Humanity loves evil rather than good. There were deluded mystics who advocated for the absurd chastity preached by certain religious sects, not realizing that nature itself rebels against this harmful abstinence. Thus nocturnal emissions occur, general decalcification through the urethra, and consequently illness. Nature is wise in its intentions, men were made for women, and women were made for men. What we must learn is how to enjoy women without harming ourselves, and for this, sexual magic is necessary. During love's ecstasy, the Gnostic restrains the sexual act, and the semen is transmuted into atomic energy, rising through certain spermatic channels to the head, and the man becomes a god. This is not understood, cannot be understood, and is not explained by the pseudo-apostles of modern medicine, because they do not know the anatomy of the seven bodies of man, hidden chemistry, or the ultra-biology of the inner human organism, which forms the fundamental basis of hormonal life and endocrine glands. The Hindus call the spermatic channels through which sexual energy ascends to the head, Ida and Pingala. These are the nerve cords related to the vagus and sympathetic nervous systems, spiraling around the spinal column in the symbolic form, represented by the caduceus of mercury. The human organism has channels for the release of semen and also possesses spermatic channels through which semen, transformed into energy, rises from the seminal vesicle to the head, because matter always transforms into energy as the great sage Einstein demonstrated. This process is what we call transmutation. In ancient times, men used the ascending spermatic channels, and even today, the Indian doctors of the Sierra Nevada de Santa Marta, Colombia, have used these channels from time immemorial, which is why they live to a very advanced age, maintaining clear minds, with black hair, intact teeth, and often having children in their 80s and hundreds. In our current civilization, however, Men at the age of 60 are decrepit. There are thousands of proofs to make the civilized and scientific man ponder on this matter. For example, in a child where their sexual force is still in their gonads, this force is latent throughout their body, and therefore, if the child gets injured, they heal faster than an adult, because the latter has been wasting their sexual force since puberty and does not know how to manage it as a child does. Young people and their parents make a great mistake when they allow their children to squander their sexual force in pleasures and indulgences. They must be taught that this great force is the vital principle. True, as official science states, it is a biological function, but the Decalogue teaches us, through the Sixth Commandment, that we must not squander this force, because it only serves the creative function. Thus the freedom that parents give their children to freely exercise their biological functions is nothing more than a crime committed against youth. Sexual magic has the following advantages. Husband and wife remain deeply in love for life, more intensely than if they were only dating. It does not burden spouses with numerous children. The woman rejuvenates, becoming more beautiful and attractive each day. 
because her husband daily charges her with powerful forces, the aging man rejuvenates and never grows old, because he is giving life with his creative force, and luck and happiness surround him from all sides, both partners awaken their clairvoyant sense, and the veil of the invisible worlds is lifted before their eyes, the sacred fire of the Holy Spirit internally illuminates them, they unite with their inner being, inner God, and become rulers of creation, with power over the four elements of nature, earth, water, air, and fire, they acquire the elixir of long life residing in the Kundalini, death is no more, all this, despite the boasting of our doctors from materialistic universities, when our book The Perfect Marriage came into circulation, thousands of black magicians angrily launched stones at us, this was despite the fact that our book teaches good and teaches man to be chaste and pure, Israel Rojasar, my treacherous disciple, could not contain his rage when he realized that we had published the secret teachings that Master Hirakacha brought to Colombia for our benefit, this led him to burn the book because he wanted humanity to never know the mysteries of sex, he only taught this secret science to his most devoted disciples, in contrast, in his many other works that brought him substantial profits, he taught nothing concrete to his readers, the masters of the venerable White Lodge, entrusted Mr. Rojas with a mission that he did not know how to fulfill, and his wisdom was filled with pride and vanity, betraying his former teacher, on Weir, the fact that some individuals misuse these teachings cannot deprive humanity of this knowledge, as long as humanity remains fornicating, it will not have light, you neither enter paradise nor allow others to enter, I will unmask the traitors and confound the tyrants in the court of public conscience, I will break all the chains of the world, I on Weir, the powerful hierophant of Egyptian mysteries, will initiate the age of Aquarius, even if I have to turn the entire world into a giant cemetery, I am not intimidated by Socrates's subtle smile, nor am I disconcerted by Aristophanes's thunderous laughter, Heaven is taken by assault because heaven belongs to the brave, the Gnostic clad in the steel armor of character, wields the sword of will and, like a formidable warrior, charges into battle to seize heaven by assault, Gnostics are the men of great storms, and amid the thunderclap, they only understand the language of majesty, when the warrior approaches initiation, he can then laugh at death, with a laughter that can shake all the caverns of the earth, then he has the right to the elixir of long life, which is drinkable gold, liquid glass, flexible, and malleable, he requests more years of life from the lords of karma to pay his debts, and thus, death and resurrection are fulfilled in the current incarnation, he unites with the inner being and then, having paid his karma, he calls the lords of karma to declare that he has chosen to stay in the world to work for humanity, consequently, he continues with his physical body until the end of the ages, the masters Count Humi, Moria, San Germain, etc., have physical bodies that date back thousands of years, all of them have incalculable ages, what would a master of greater mysteries do by constantly changing bodies, the founder of the college of initiates is the Mahaguru, and he will remain with us until the last initiate has reached his stature, the author of Atomic Gods tells us that in Egypt, there are two masters of truly unfathomable ages, one of whom is mentioned in ancient religious scriptures, the master preserves his body for millions of years, because he possesses the elixir of long life, which resides in the kundalini, the master lives, engendering his body daily through the kundalini, the cells of a master do not wither because the fire of the kundalini does not allow them to wither, therefore, the kundalini is the elixir of long life, this fire is the drinkable gold of the ancient alchemists, and it is the tree of life mentioned in Genesis in the following verse, and out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food, the tree of life also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of knowledge of good and evil, Genesis chapter 2, verse 9, the tree of life is the kundalini, and the tree of knowledge of good and evil is the semen, both trees are in God's garden, and a river went out of Eden to water the garden, and from thence it was parted and became into four heads, the name of the first is Pison, that is it which compasseth the whole land of Havilah, where there is gold, and the gold of that land is good, there is delium and the onyx stone, the land of Havilah is our own body, and the gold of this land is the solar atoms of our seminal system, which is the drinkable gold of semen, the name of the second river is Gihon, the same is it that compasseth the whole land of Ethiopia, this second river is the cerebrospinal fluid, which is the other pole of our seminal system, surrounding our entire land of Ethiopia, i.e., our head and throat, as with the cerebrospinal fluid, we form the brain and throat, 
and the name of the third river is Hittical, that is it which goeth toward the east of Assyria, and the fourth river is Euphrates, Genesis chapter 2, verses 11, 12, 13, and 14. The river that goes toward the east of Assyria and the Euphrates are the two poles of a woman's seminal force. The woman is ahead of us because she is the gate to paradise, and the gate is always ahead. Eden is the same sex, and the tree of life is in the same Eden. The great hierophant Eliphaz Levi said that the great Arcanum was the tree of life bathed by the four rivers of Eden. But then, fearing, he said in a moment of excitement, I fear I may have said too much. This is the terrible, unspeakable secret that no initiate has dared to divulge. This is the terrible secret of the great Arcanum. These four rivers of Eden are the sexual forces of man and woman. The tree of life is in the midst of the four rivers of Eden. If man, with all his vices and passions, could have partaken of the tree of life, we would still have Nero alive, and the great tyrants would never have left a single moment of light for humanity. Caligula would still live, and the twelve Caesars of Rome would still be seated on their thrones. Fortunately, Jehovah knew how to guard the tree of life, so he drove out the man, and he placed at the east of the Garden of Eden cherubims, and a flaming sword which turned every way, to keep the way of the tree of life, Genesis chapter 3, verse 24. Turn on your nine mystical lamps, O Chela, listen, in the depths of your soul, there is a master lurking mystically, awaiting the moment to be realized, hear me, beloved disciple, that master is your inner self, and you are the soul of the master, the inner self becomes the master through the fruits of millennia of experiences and countless reincarnations, do not forget, beloved disciple, that you are a soul, and your body is your garment, listen to me, dear disciple, when your garment is damaged, what do you do? You discard it because it no longer serves you, and you cannot deny that. Now, if you wish to replace your garment, where do you go? You will tell me that you go to the tailor to have a new garment made. Well, dear disciple, as I mentioned, you are a soul, and your body is your garment. Your garment of flesh was well made to fit you, and it was made by two workers, your father and your mother. When that garment is damaged, what do you do? You cast it aside, and if you wish to replace it, you must find a new pair of workers, one male and one female, to craft a new garment of flesh, well made and tailored to your measure. You may ask, how? And I will ask you, how was your current garment of flesh made? In the same manner, the new tailors will create another garment of flesh for you. Why does this seem strange to you? When you take off a cloth garment and put on another, do you cease to be Mr. XX and forget your business and your accounts? Of course not. Whether you wear a cloth or denim garment, you always tend to your affairs. The same happens when you, as a soul, don a garment of flesh. You settle your old debts because you have no other choice. Those debts are your wrongdoings. Listen, dear reader, you have shed millions of garments of flesh since the beginning of the world. If you do not remember this, others do. The day will come when you can recall your countless deaths and rebirths since the formation of the world. Do not forget that Adam is not a single individual, and Eve is not a single woman. Adam represents the millions of men from Lemuria, and Eve represents the millions of women from Lemuria. The souls you see today dressed in flesh and bone are the same as those from Lemuria, who were then clothed in different garments of flesh and bone. At the dawn of life, the four thrones emanated millions of human bodies in an embryonic state from their own life. These human bodies developed through the ages and are now our wonderful garments made from the earth's clay. The Bible explains all of this. However, to study the Bible, one must have studied occultism, because the Bible is a book of occultism, and it cannot be read literally like a newspaper. The Bible is the book of the Gnostics, and only by being a Gnostic can it be understood. Let us now delve into the problem of life and death. Listen, reader, every time you put on a new garment of flesh, you become slightly less wicked, a bit less of a murderer, a bit less envious because it is true that in life, you learn through suffering. Indeed, the soul becomes perfected through suffering, just as a wild colt is tamed with lashes. Eventually, the soul merges with the inner self and becomes an angel. This is achieved by being born and dying millions of times. However, it is also true that in a single well-utilized life, one can achieve union with the inner self. Furthermore, it is possible to remain young and avoid death through the elixir of long life. Mengner lived seven times seven centuries with his body of flesh and bone. Zanoni also lived for millions of years, always young. Count Saint Germain currently resides in Tibet with the same body he had in the 17th, 18th, and part of the 19th centuries in Europe. 
We, the Gnostics, laugh at death, we possess the secret to defy the Grim Reaper, as we declared in the first chapter, with the Sword of Democles, we will make the untimely guests flee, we feel omnipotent and, with a gesture of sovereign rebellion, we challenge science, foolish doctors, ignorant biologists, pedantic physicists, where is your wisdom, death claims everyone, rich and poor, believers and unbelievers, death conquers all but us, the Gnostics, we laugh at death and place it beneath our feet because we are omnipotent, kindle your nine mystical lamps, O Lanu, disciple, remember that each of the nine initiations of lesser mysteries, has a musical note and an instrument that produces it, there are three conditions required to acquire the elixir of long life, sexual magic, perfect sanctity, and the ability to consciously travel in the astral body, Many can start by traveling with their physical body through the astral plane, because it is easier, later, they become adept at using and controlling the astral body, others gradually attain sanctity by summing up their own flaws, and then progressively eliminating each one, dedicating two months to each, anyone attempting to eliminate several flaws at once is like a hunter trying to catch ten hares simultaneously, in that case, none are captured, now, concerning sexual magic, one must condition the body gradually, some individuals are so brutish that they could have a leg amputated during sexual intercourse without feeling the slightest pain, these are human beasts, in the beginning, the couple can practice while standing, the man will massage his partner from the coccyx upwards, using three fingers index, middle, and thumb, with the intention of awakening the kundalini in his partner, and vice versa, the woman will do the same to her partner, with the intention of awakening his kundalini, the mind must be focused on the spinal cord, not the sexual organs, the days for beginners will be Thursday and Friday at dawn, initially, there will be no sexual connection, later on, the man can introduce his penis between the vagina, and withdraw it in time to prevent seminal ejaculation, the man and woman should kiss and caress each other during this practice, uttering the mantra myo like this, e e a o i o u o seven or more times, one letter for each breath, when you feel strong pain in the coccyx, it is a sign that the kundalini has awakened, it will rise through the spinal column, vertebra by vertebra, according to our moral merits, the awakening of the kundalini is celebrated in the children's hall with a grand party, in the progress, development, and evolution of the kundalini, ethics are the deciding factor, it is necessary for the disciple to train in the astral plane and attend the praetor of the holy Gnostic church on Fridays and Sundays at dawn. On other days, the disciple can receive wisdom in the esoteric instruction hall of the temple. In the entrance of the holy Gnostic church, there are guardians who only permit disciples to pass. If their behavior has been upright during the day, these guardians have scales to weigh the disciples' good and bad deeds during the day. In the Gnostic Church, there is also a lens to examine the disciples' colors. When the disciple does not have all their complete colors, they cannot bring memories back to the body. These colors often remain in the physical body due to daily concerns. In our brain, there is an extremely fine nervous tissue unknown to mainstream science. This tissue serves as an instrument to bring our inner memories. But if there is any damage to this tissue, the disciple cannot bring their memories back to the brain, in such cases, one must request the healing of these centers from the master's Hermes, Hippocrates, or Paracelsus, write a letter to the temple of Alden, requesting help from one of the three mentioned masters, this letter should first be saturated with incense, and then burned with fire, while pronouncing the mantras om tat sat om, this act should be performed with faith while kneeling, praying to the heavens and begging to be heard, indeed, the material part of the letter is burned, but the astral counterpart goes directly to the master, to whom the letter was addressed, the master reads the astral counterpart of the letter, and proceeds to heal the disciple, the temple of Alden is the temple of science, internal bodies can also become ill and need physicians, the masters of science are rich in wisdom, and they heal the internal bodies of the initiated and anyone who seeks help, one of the most serious hindrances to the practice of sexual magic is impotence. Excessive sexual intercourse, among other things, leads to impotence, and none of the remedies invented by allopathic doctors have been effective. However, daily practice of sexual magic can cure impotence. Now I will provide two formulas to cure those suffering from this terrible disease, provided there is no injury to the viral member. Very few human beings have stopped to meditate on the transcendent value of the plant called aloe vera. I have seen this plant hanging on a wall without fresh air, water, light, or soil. 
yet it thrives, multiplying its leaves and reproducing miraculously. What does it live on? What does it feed on? These are questions that no scientist has ever stopped to consider. Not even Mr. Israel Rojas, who has written and spoken extensively on botany, has ever thought to study this case. The reality is that this gentleman is merely a copyist of Juanzen's work. This is precisely the problem with all these modern pseudobotanists. They do nothing but copy what others say but it never occurs to anyone to investigate in the wonderful laboratory of nature. Pharmacists only know how to make German schnapps and prepare aloe vera syrups. That's all they do with their famous aloe vera crystals. It's a great remedy, but the profound importance of aloe vera is not even remotely understood by them. Aloe vera feeds directly on the sun's ultraviolet rays, on the crystalline substance of the sun the crystals become the crystallization of the sun's astral light. The crystals are, therefore, the sun semen, and there is a great resemblance between aloe vera crystals and human semen. Aloe vera is, therefore, a great panacea for curing impotence. The procedure is as follows. Place a white panela in a skillet pot or cauldron to melt over the fire. The container should not contain water. Once the panela is melted, add the crystals from a whole aloe vera, add about 10 grams of Juro iron, and stir well, all over the fire, with a grinder. After mixing everything well, remove the container from the fire, bottle its contents, add a little sodium benzo to prevent fermentation, label it, and take it by the spoonful, one every hour. With this marvelous formula, impotence is cured. In our upcoming book and preparation titled Treatise on Occult Medicine and Practical Magic, we will provide another marvelous formula for curing impotence. A woman who wishes to awaken the Kundalini must practice sexual magic with her husband. She should also vocalize the IAO and refrain from the act. The woman should also withdraw from her husband before the female semen is ejaculated. This is how the Kundalini awakens in a positive manner in a woman. The only difference in relation to Kundalini in men is that the two spermatic channels, IDA and Pingala, are reversed from men and men. The order is, IDA on the right and Pingala on the left in men, and in women, IDA on the left and Pingala on the right. These two spermatic channels resonate with the fond note of nature. Listen to me, dear reader. When you feel properly prepared, request from the Holy Gnostic Church that the masters subject you to rigorous tests and if you desire special assistance, invoke me, on where, and I will guide you through the nine portals that will give you the right to ascend to the Golgotha of the High Initiation, with the rough and heavy wooden cross that they give you in the first initiation of minor mysteries. Remember, good disciple, that this cross weighs with the weight of your own karma, and do not let yourself fall, because the disciple who falls has to suffer and struggle a lot to recover what is lost, Listen to me, good disciple, the path is hard and full of pebbles and thorns, poverty and infamy, will remove their masks to hurt you in the middle of the journey, you will sweat blood, and your feet will also bleed in the middle of the journey from the path's pebbles. The path of high initiation is the path of Golgotha, a path of anguish and tears. In the silence of the night, light your candles, and in the profound silence where you keep watch, remember your inner God and enter his cave, for he waits deep inside you waiting for the hour to be realized. Light your candles, O Chela, in the deep silence of the night and go deep into the sacred city of the serpent. Your God is there, waiting for you. Light the fire of the night, close your eyes, remove your mind from all worldly concerns, relax a little, and try to communicate with your inner God in mystery through inner meditation, O Lanu. When you learn to enter your own cave through deep inner meditation, you can communicate with your inner self, O disciple. Light the sacred fire in the deep night where you keep watch, dispelling the dense darkness. Your God wants to speak to you in the burning bush of Oreb. Sensitize your seven churches with your chant, O disciple, and do not forget that the word opens the seven gates of the seven churches of your organism. Sing, disciple, sing. Ephesus corresponds to the C, Smyrna vibrates with the D, Pergamum with the E, Thyatira with the F, Sardis with the G, Philadelphia with the A and Laodicea corresponds to the B in music, I clairvoyance, note B, E hidden hearing, note A, O heart, intuition, note G, U solar plexus, note F, A lungs, vibrates with note A, one hour of daily vocalization, singing these vowels, awakens all these internal powers, Israel Rojas in his book Logos Sophia, says that by vocalizing I, the blood rises to the head, with E, the blood goes to the neck, 
With O, it goes to the heart, with U, the blood goes to the intestines, and with A, it goes to the lungs, of course, this is true, and consequently, these organs can be healed when they are sick, but why does Israel Rojas remain silent about what's best, why did he deny the suffering humanity the secret of hidden vocalization, why didn't he reveal the secret of hidden vocalization for developing internal powers, why such selfishness toward suffering humanity? Israel Rojas is nothing more than a selfish exploiter of occult teachings. When did this man publicly teach the mantra of the healing chain A.E. Gay? Pronounce Gutchurli as A.E. Gay. He demands a million oaths from his disciples to give them the A.E. Gay mantra. This is not spirituality. It's sheer selfishness and vile exploitation. The A.E. Gay mantra and the Panclara mantra, pronounced as Pan Clara, serve to heal ourselves and others. In one of the Rosicrucian rituals that Master Hirakacha brought to Colombia, there is a mantra prayer for sexual magic that should be recited at the moment of practicing sexual magic with the priestess. The prayer goes like this, Prayer, O oh Hadit, Winged Serpent of Light, be the Gnostic secret of my being, the central point of my connection, the sacred sphere and the blue of the sky are mine, O A O Kakaf and A Kansa three times. These mantras make our seminal force rise from the sexual glands to the head. Why doesn't Mr. Rojas teach any of this to his disciples? Why does he keep such important information from humanity? Why is he so selfish? The claim that Mr. Israel Rojas received initiation at the hands of Master Zanoni in Bogota is laughable and could be used as a joke in a comedy. Those who personally know Master Zanoni are well aware that the Master has never remotely considered living in Bogota. Everything that Israel Rojas learned in Bogota was from a clever Antioquian who taught him about herbs, but that was not Master Zanoni. Master Zanoni was guillotined during the French Revolution and has not taken a physical body since then. When Israel Rojas speaks about alias Gomez Campuzano, the Antioquian who posed as Zanoni, he seems like a parish priest. What a curious sense of humor Mr. Rojas has. In his book Logos Sophia Israel Rojas gives lengthy and complicated dissertations on the word, but it never occurs to him to publicly provide his disciples with the hidden key to the great universal word of life. And that key is none other than sexual magic. When Kundalini ignites the language atoms in the seminal system, a man acquires the power to speak in all the world's languages. The great enlightened beings of the Atlantean chain speak all the world's languages. Kundalini becomes a creator in the throat. The magician can create a specific figure with the mind and materialize it through the creative word of Kundalini. This is how angels create living things. And when a person unites with the inner being, reaching the high initiation, they then speak the divine golden word spoken by the gods, and they ascend to the pleroma of eternal happiness. They become creator gods through the word. A book that discusses the word and does not teach sexual magic is simply a farce. Therefore, I consider Israel Rojas's book, Logos Sophia, useful only for rapping cumin. Removing the mysteries of sex from the word is the height of madness, because sex is the very foundation of the word, and one cannot speak the word of gold without awakening kundalini which is only awakened by practicing sexual magic. One who unites with the inner being becomes omnipotent and omniscient. They know how to command and obey, never becoming arrogant, because they have learned to be simple and humble in the cosmos. The master's vision penetrates all the spheres of nature and, like a sovereign of the infinite, they unleash storms, calm hurricanes, make the earth tremble, and use lightning as a scepter and fire as a carpet for their feet. By practicing sexual magic, we will obtain the elixir of long life and become omnipotent, but it is essential to first learn to obey the white hierarchy in order to achieve omnipotence. I am the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Blessed are those who keep his commandments so that his power may be on the tree of life and they may enter through the gates into the city. Revelation chapter 22 verses 13 and 14. The Song of Songs. I feel a tormenting fire in my entrails. It is the delightful wine of love, I am the rose of Sharon, and the lily of the valleys, I am the delightful perfume of passion, I live among the cups of the crown poets, I am the song of the Abigails, I am the love of the starry heavens, I am the song of songs, by on weir, the honey from your lips stirs my entrails, and I feel that I love you, you are the mountain of myrrh, and the hill of incense you are the fire of the arcanum you are the erotic hill, and the delightful smile where love has undressed, now, joyful with the immortal wine, let us light a fire and sing the Valkyries, with a triumphant song of flames and poetry, come liquor, come light and music, 
Let the couples dance on the soft carpet. Let the rose of Sharon shine among the cups, and let the fire devour the shadows. Come joy, dream, and poetry. Let us dance happily in the arms of love, no matter what they say. Let us enjoy in the delightful nuptial chamber, among the nard and myrrh, and let us sing our triumphant hymn of light and poetry.